Academy professor at uh, Aalto University and the chair of the International Selection Committee for the Millennium Technology Prize will present the achievements of uh, Dr. Suntola in more detail in a moment. Millennium Technology Prize is a tribute to innovations for a better life. The prize highlights the extensive impacts of science and technology and innovation on society and people around the world. I'm pleased to say that this bold mission is wholly in line with the ambitions of Aalto University. Our strategic partnership with the Millennium Technology Prize supports Aalto's vision to build a sustainable society driven by innovation and entrepreneurship. When founded in 2010, uh, Aalto University was given a national mission to strengthen Finland's uh, innovative capacity through first class research, art and education. Our strategy is to build cutting edge knowledge and technology so we can offer solutions to the most pressing challenges uh, that the uh, society faces. These challenges with all their complexities, call for education. They call for education of professionals with the knowledge and capabilities to build a sustainable society. They call for education of professionals with the ability to increase welfare through disruptive change. With this in mind, we at Aalto strive to educate real game changers. But to do so, we need to recognize that change begins with children and young people. We need to continue lowering the thresholds for children and academia to come together. Today, after the lecture, we will open the Millennium Youth Prize competition together with the Technology Academy of Finland. Millennium Youth Prize is a completely new competition for 14 to 18 year olds. It invites young people to present solutions to global challenges. Through this award, we want to inspire young people to engage with technology and innovation and find new kinds of solutions for a better future. But now, I would like to invite Academy Professor Päivi Törmä, the chair of the International Selection Committee for the Millennium Technology Prize, to introduce Dr. Tuomas Untola and his groundbreaking achievements. Thank you. to hear uh, a lecture by the Millennium Prize 2018 winner, Dr. Tuomo Sundola. Millennium Prize is given to a groundbreaking innovation that enhances the quality of people's life in a sustainable uh, manner. This year it has been given to the ALD method that um, can be used for growing extremely thin, high-quality conformal films. ALD is actually one of the key technologies that have uh, made it possible to continue the Moore's law until today. So if you have a smartphone, switch it to silent now and admire it at the same time. It has ALD inside. So I hope there are a lot of future Millennium Prize winners in the audience. Because the story of Tuomo Sundula could be your story. Uh, he did his uh, master's degree and doctorate here in Otanimi. So I'm asking how many of you have studied or worked in Otanimi or are doing it at the present? Hands up. You see? Yes. And then Tuomo Sundola, <coughs> when he was studying, he worked as a teaching assistant, TA, Laskuharjoitus Assari. So let's ask, uh, whom of you have uh, worked as teaching assistant? Yeah, okay, again. So then 
uh, in the exercise classes that he was giving, there was a young student who came to him with a paper, scientific paper, and said that, I found this paper about the use of amorphous films in electronics and physics. Please, assistant, can you explain it to me? And he answered, no, I can't, but um, I will read the paper and then I will explain. And while reading uh, about these things, Tuomo Sundola became so interested that he went to his professor and asked, that, uh, can I do a PhD on these amorphous films? Yes, said the professor, and that's what he did. And after doing the PhD on amorphous films, he thought that these amorphous films are no good. We need better films. And then a few years after, when he was working at the company Instrumentarium, he made those better films, and that's what we will hear about now. So, ladies and gentlemen, Tuomo Suntola. I did my study at, uh, in Helsinki at Hietaniemen Tori, but then I fini finished it in, in Otaniemi here. Okay, but let's then dive to the secrets of atomic layers. And uh, we start by looking at what is ALD, where and why is ALD needed. Purpose is very important, so that it's, it's worthwhile thinking why we start doing something. What makes ALD unique? What gives the special properties to the ALD material layers? And how was ALD invented? How was everything started? Huh? And then we look how everything progressed in time, timeline of the ALD. We look a little bit different, different aspects of the timeline. And then we look at the technological scientific impact of ALD, which is the which, which uh, we know today, and, and we can see how much uh, very kind of, of uh, let's say, basic issue, how uh, uh, widely it spreads. If we make specific uh, uh, development, then the application area generally is restricted, but when we go deep, it needs more time, but then it spreads large. Okay. Let's start from the first question. What is ALE and why is ALE needed? And it's written here. You know, ALE is a method for growing highly ordered material layers. ALE layers are built up sequentially, one atomic layer in a reaction cycle, which guarantees extreme uniformity even in layers of a few atomic layer thickness. That's what it, what it means. 
Highly ordered material layers are essential, for example, in modern semiconductor devices needed in computers, mobile phones, essentially, and practically in all electronic equipment. Traditionally, uh, silicon technology was so-called planar technology, which meant that all components... Uh, sorry, I had to push this button here. All components were built in one plane, on one plane. So this is a picture of an, of an element in an integrated circuit uh, uh, <coughs> uh, MOS transistor, where <coughs> some of the critical uh, or the most critical layer is the uh, gate dielectric, and uh, uh, we can see that we need a lot of space in. in uh, making such a component. The, the contribution in ALD in this particular case is that now we can squeeze down the dimensions of an individual transistor, but, not, but also one trick in that is not only making thin films, but we can, we can use three dimensions in the structure. So instead of, of making a planar structure, we can squeeze the transistor and get uh, electrical <coughs> even improved electrical properties by handling the channels, uh, current channels uh, in three dimensions and control that from, from uh, all, di all sides on all directions. So that uh, with the ALE technology, now the component density is huge indeed. So in one microprocessor, which is about the, the size of your thumbnail, we may have from one to 10 billion transistors. So it's quite unbelievable. So uh, now we discuss about 10 nanometer technology. So let's go further. ALE layers can be used to enhance the properties of solar cells. Solar cells, which is a large area component or, or device in, in uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, where it's used as uh, as passivation layer, as a passivation layer between different constructional parts of the battery in order to prevent uh, unwanted chemical interactions. And further on, in LED lights, the uses may be different. For example, some of the phosphors materials that convert the, the uh, light, the frequency or wavelength uh, of the emission they are powder type materials. Some very effective powders are moisture sensitive. But with the ALE technology, we can encapsulate individual microscopic particles so effectively that the, the, the materials can be used. And in fact, this is a very important part of the applications. We, can, we have, have, have medical devices, implants, which can be put uh, 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 in, in body and ALD layer then prevents the unwanted interactions with body uh, liquids and, and also vice versa to protect the material from the, from the body interactions. And next one here, uh, in, in some <coughs> mobile phones there are, use, uh, there are uh, flexible, flexible displays using a more, uh, active matrix uh, organic light emitting diodes. Among LEDs, and uh, also those materials are moisture sensitive. So that's uh, to the way of making them them usable is uh, we need a passivation layer, and the best way of doing that is the ALE because it gives extremely dense material, which is a basic characteristics of the of the ALD material build up. A little bit surprising. Uh, application was announced. I, I saw a, a, a news some time ago that new <coughs> uh, mirror coating technology will re revolutionize telescopes. So it simply means that we have, we have silver uh, mirrors and in order to prevent the darkening of the silver and also in uh, ensuring as perfect optical uh, a coating layer on the, on the mirror as possible, we utilize the atomic layer deposition technology. So you can imagine that we, we need huge machines to put a full telescope uh, mirror in, in such a machine, but, but it's worthwhile doing. 
Okay, so what is the secret behind the, the ALD? What makes it unique? What gives the special properties of the ALD materials? Let's see. As a reference, we have some of the conventional thin film technologies. In fact, this drawing is very old indeed. I, I draw it originally uh, uh, in mid 70s when I introduced why we should work with ALE. And <clears throat> as a reference, we have the traditional thin film technologies, which I was aware of uh, based on my, my earlier work in uh, technical university. We have vacuum evaporation, or oh, let's look the laser here, vacuum evaporation, sputtering, CVD. So <clears throat> basically all these methods are met methods of transferring material from a source to a substrate. So it means that we, are, we don't have any major ways of controlling the build-up of the material on the substrate. So there's some kind of, <clears throat> some kind of three dimensions nucleation where molecules are looking energetically optimal sites from their, with their neighbors and then we might need some kind of heat treatment in order to improve the crystallinity and, and get the, the film as uniform as possible. With ALD we <coughs> influence on the, on the build-up mechanism so instead of going the whole way from, from a disordered phase to an ordered phase, we start with the ordered phase. So we offer uh, making a compound of red and blue materials. We start with one of them only and in the case the blue atoms, uh, uh, sorry, the, the red atoms can find blue surface. They stay there. So in fact we are applying we are creating conditions where nature takes care of the control. So we create conditions where the only way of getting one atomic layer fixed uh, uh, on the surface is that it finds a compound bond which is strong enough to keep it there. So we can, uh, <coughs> we can uh, dose the material as much, much we like but the surface accepts only one atomic layer. So that's the key in the control. So in the next step, we introduce uh, the, the second element. It can be used, we can, in some special cases, as the one we started with zinc sulfide, we can use elements themselves as the re reactant. But in most cases, we need some volatile compounds of the source materials, of the, uh, uh, of the um, elements of the final compound in order to create conditions where the, uh, where the uh, uh, reactant don't condensate but offers the, the necessary uh, bond with the surface. So very simply then we count the number of reaction steps and we know the thickness we, we get and we like to get. Sounds very simple, it's basically it's very simple but, but <coughs> finally the chemistry is, is quite complicated, demanding and ALD on the other hand is a method of going uh, to surface chemistry at atomic level. So now we can, instead of thinking about chemical reactions or moles of material, we discuss or, or chemical reaction between individual molecules or atoms and surface where we can even take into the consideration the geometrical uh, coordination of the atoms. So first we introduce the first material and the, the, the uh, <coughs> result with the reaction is that we get, get a completed monolayer and in the next step we offer the second element and, and uh, we get uh, the, the, uh, the full compound layer and that is then repeated a necessary number of times. As I, yeah, the nature doesn't work that simply indeed. So that surfaces make discontinuation of the bulk, which means that in the bulk the individual atoms are coordinated in all di directions. On a surface they have to, co to, to coordinate on the surface only, which means that in that step the <coughs> Uh, individual atom occupies, occupies more than the space of the of a, of a final atom and that's why that was my first problem when we started working with I was expecting to have a full monolayer in a reaction cycle and I was very disappointed that it doesn't occur 
And finally, I understood. I'm not a chemist, so that perhaps, having been a chemist, I had understood that earlier, that's a good thing to, uh, not to restrict your studies to a too narrow, narrow area, so that it's really worthwhile try to understand something else also. Anyway, the, the good news here, here was that, that in the next steps then, uh, nature takes care of the final, final organization and builds up, uh, builds up the full monolayer then in, one or, uh, in two or three cycles. And the is essential anyway occurs that we get the, the, the fully uh, organized material layers. As I stated, we prefer using compounds of the, of the uh, final compound, of the elements of the final compound and uh, there are a lot of tricks that can be then used to uh, find out processing conditions that fits with the other part of a production line, for example. With semiconductors, very often we, don't, uh, we must not uh, increase the temperature of the substrate too much in, not, in order not to, to disturb uh, the, the other structural parts of the devices so that it's then advantageous to find highly volatile source materials and very reactive uh, uh, reactants so that we can decrease the temperature of the, of the growth. So that it finally, although the basic idea is very simple, it finds to very uh, demanding chemistry. Let's go further so the, uh, the result is. So this illustrates what I, what I explained, so that the, we need certain minimum temperature <coughs> in order to prevent uh, precursor cond condensation, condensation of the source material. On the other hand, if our temperature is too high, then we may lose even the, the first atomic layer which we are aiming to, to build up there. And, uh, when we use the, the compounds as our reactants, there are also other demands. Uh, <coughs> if, we, if the temperature is too high, it may be that our volatile compound decomposes and results in, in unwanted growth. And on the other hand, we need to have a reaction temperature high enough to make the reaction to occur. So that there are, there are several steps and all these uh, factors must, must be considered for each part, partial reaction, so each, each phase for, for each, uh, uh, each reaction step. And in fact, there may be, the chemistry may be more, more complicated, there may be an other saturation level also. Okay, so this is a semantic diagram of, of an ALE reactor. We are feeding the source material. Typically, a reactor is a gas flow reactor. So we have an inert gas flow at the low pressure, about one millibar or something like that. And we, one at a time, we inject the necessary source material and they go through a channel or substrate. And you can see the big advantage here, which means that, that uh, even the, the front end of the channel, uh, the surface there gets far more material than, the, than the, uh, the tail here, we get only one atomic layer. Uh, one uh, atomic layer, it means that we can, we can compensate the longer time of build up of the material with higher density of substrate. So we can handle many substrate in a small, very small chamber and that's the way of, of guaranteeing the, the productivity. Because in, for in our applications, which in the early state was the electroluminescent flat panel displays, the substrate size is very high and that's why, that's why and, and the th film thickness, although it's only one thousandth of a millimeter, and in atomic scale, it's, it means thousands of atomic layers which are needed, so the time is very important here. In, in, in modern semiconductors, the layers may be only few atomic layers for the critical, critical films such as the gate dielectric, so that, uh, that then the time factor is, is not that important. So let's go, go further. Because we have a surface control process, it means that the, the growth of the material follows exactly the original surface, whatever is the geometrical shape. You can see that we get extremely uniform films on a, on a <coughs> structured surface. And that is a key property and extremely, that's one of the, of the enabling 
uh, phenomena that has made the, the present nanoscale semiconductors possible. So it's very, very important. Also, we can tailor material, so it's kind of super lattice that, that we have, we, have uh, we can change the material type even uh, uh, in, uh, at each atomic build-up, uh, its layer, and we can penetrate even to very deep trenches on the, on the uh, surface so that you can see the microscopic picture of the bottom of the, of the deep trench here, and it's still extremely uniform. That's one way of increasing the usable area on a, on a semiconductor wafer, for example, that's important in memory chips when we need a lot of, a lot of active surface. So this is, uh, repeats the same. So where do we find in our mobile phone? Where can we find our, our ALD layers? They certainly are invisible because they are only a few atomic layers or something like that. But if we first open the, open the phone and we get, get the, find the PC board, in the next step, we can, on the PC board, we can find the, the <coughs> a, a microprocessor. In the microprocessor, we, need the, we, we now have then the millions or billions of, of, of transistors, so that is now the same picture as I showed earlier, which is now squeezed to a very, to very small dimensions. And uh, this is a, a picture from Intel of the, the uh, uh, 10 nanometer structure in fact, today in commercial production, I think they have the 14 nanometer structure, but we are going still further. And it's not a limit, so that I'm seeing laboratory uh, uh, demos of at least the, the, the programs for going down to at least two nanometers or something like that. So that in today's <coughs> microprocessor, we may have something like 10 billion transistors in, in one chip. It's, it's amazing. So here we, this is repeating the, the type of structures. So ideally, a transistor or the switch is, a, is, is a symmetric, so we, can, we have the gate controlled from, from every, almost every side, and these are real, uh, <coughs> are, are real uh, microscopic pictures. Let's go further. That was the same we already saw. Here we are. Oh, let's then go to the story. How was ALE invented? Not story, but history. So, in, in, in the late 60s, early 70s, I worked as, the, as a, a, a scientist, researcher in Helsinki University of Technology and in, in VTT semiconductor laboratory. My first industrial work after my thesis was, uh, was a humidity sensor, which is a thin film device which was ordered by company Weisala, which is Finnish meteorological instrument company. And that was a, a success, very successful. Finland is a small country, so that the reputation then waked up uh, instrumentarium and they asked me to start a research unit and, and propose something. So it's a very challenging situation for young scientists to propose something. And let's see how it proceeded. I made a, a quick market study what kind of things we could probably use with the available technology. For me, it was mainly thin film technologies. And uh, as a result, we could find that the, probably there are some sensors as a, as a kind of reference to the, to the humidity sensor. But on the other hand, it was a huge demand for the instrument to have a flat panel displays. At that time, there were no flat panel displays technologies available. And in the, in the university, I had given some lectures on future displays, so I was kind of, of, of uh, familiar with the area. So my proposal was that let's develop an electron flat panel displays. So that's what happened in the board meeting then. 
board of directors, and I warned that nobody has been able to do it yet, but anyway, let's do it. Let's start working. What do you think would be the, the response here? It should be shown here. So we get a, a few question marks, yes. Very lively audience indeed. Then we are waiting the response from the chairman here. And it was here. I'm still confused, but at a higher level. Let's go ahead. So that was the start. Okay. And that how the ALE itself was mine. Based on the experience, it was nice to have the introduction from the Amorphos concerning the Amorphos films because one of the, of the findings there, I was very disappointed that we couldn't make a, a, a practical component, commercial uh, picosecond uh, switch with that technology, but I understood that well-controlled electronic properties require well-ordered material, also working with, with having, having been working with uh, vacuum evaporation, sputtering, and things like that, I understood that well-ordered material requires well-ordered processing conditions, and the choice here was that whether to try to refine the existing technologies or think completely something, something new. And at that time, because I, had been in, I, I was invited to start new research uh, activity, there, we didn't have the laboratory equipment yet. So the only tool I had at that time was the periodic table of the elements which was hanging on the wall in front of me, and, and looking at that, that I, I then finally got the idea at how about sequential build-up of components. And that's how it was started. Let's see how it proceeded then. So uh, this picture here is the picture of the very first, very first reactor. It looked like this, so it was a vacuum chamber and there's a rotating disk here which uh, makes the, the uh, substrate to, to see the zinc source here and sulfur source here and it was rotated two cycles per second so it was quite a fast uh, switching and during the summer when the construction was, was made I calculated the necessary necessary vapor pressures and temperatures in order to uh, demonstrate the the build-up of the material. And as I tell you, my disappointment was that it didn't make a full atomic layer. But the nice thing is that it made the saturation. And, and uh, that's why we, we got ahead. So it still needed a couple of years in order to re refine the machinery. We had to, to, to make everything from the beginning because there was, a, there was no technology for... for uh, fast fitting of thousands of reaction cycles and fast fitting means that we have to switch chemical, chemicals which are aggressive and, and uh, the switching time must be less than, less than a second in order to get acceptable speeds. So that uh, finally we get uh, the, the EL panel uh, uh, fabricated and it turned out that the ALD films really were far beyond, had much better properties than any demonstrated at, at the time. So the, the problem indeed is that we have, to, we have the 200 volt voltage across one, one micron film thickness, which means that we, we need really uh, uh, excellent dielectric strength. And it turned out that with ALE, the dielectric strength of the materials was uh, better by a factor of two, three, or, or even up to ten in some particular case, so that it really had a, had a big uh, influence. That was a huge success, so that, that happened. We introduced that in SID meeting, Society for Information Display, play in San Diego in 1980, and uh, from that scientific or, or technical conference we got uh, something like uh, three and a half thousand product inquiries. So that was the good news. The bad news, of course, was that we didn't have the production line at that time. So that we lost a huge announcement and, and <coughs> our campaign. And uh, of course, the scientific value was that you can see the, the very nice style of, of late 70s here. 
So this is the SID representatives, uh, and the, I'm, I'm staying here. My colleague Jorma Anson, Sven Lindfors, and Arto Pakkala, and we received the, the outstanding paper award <coughs> from, from that conference then. And the first uh, pilot production line, and the pilot product was the famous uh, information display at Helsinki Vanta Airport, which stayed there for, for something like 13 years until the reconstruction of the terminal building. There was something like, uh, like uh, 3,000 uh, character modules like this, and they were running the the, all their lifetime. And in my knowledge, not uh, a single uh, character module was changed during that time. So that tells that the, the reliability of the ALD films was really, really excellent. So this is now the timeline of the, of the electroluminescent flat panels because that was our first product, uh, product goal. You can see we started with the instrumentarium. It was, uh, <coughs> the project was then sold to Lohia Corporation. We, we got a lot of expertise in electronics and it was very, very helpful for us then to, to go on. The, the factory in Olari was built in 1983-84, uh, uh, and the first products, which was called Finlux display, was then started, uh, we started gradually then the production, which was quite a, quite a demanding task. The, uh, the EL manufacturing was sold to Planar International in 19, 1990, and, and they continue with the, with the displays. And finally, in 2007, the, the activity was sold to Benek, who now <coughs> have, the, have the building in their the use, and also they make ALE reactors uh, <coughs> in the same building. ALD, EL didn't come a major thin film technology, and one reason was that it, it's capable for yellow color mainly. So we could make full, full color displays, and also for small devices, 200 volts for operational voltage is a little bit problematic. But it, it's still used in very special, very demanding applications. It tolerates low temperatures down to one, minus 100 centigrade easily, if the electronics it works on the, in that, and also it's, it stands for high vibration and mechanical shocks and that kind. So it's used in, in special things. Uh, uh, that's a picture which I found from Benex uh, 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 net page. So it's a transparent. With that technology, we can make transparent displays, and, and the text uh, appears somewhere here. But let's go further. Let's see the time. timeline of the ALE itself, how the commercialized steps proceeded. So we started here and, and we first made the machinery needed for the production of the EL panels. Oh, sorry. And then, well, I <coughs> had the excellent chance now to, to uh, enter to new applications. Microchemistry LTD was, was established in uh, uh, 1987 as a subsidiary of Neste Corporation, the, the national oil com company. So once again, we have new resources and new ideas. Originally, we started working, applying uh, ALD for thin film solar cells. Uh, originally, ALD was used to convert electricity into light. Now we try to, to make the same vice versa. Why not? Uh, we demonstrated some nice laboratory results, but we couldn't see the commercial capability at that time with, with those kind of devices. But instead, we concentrated to ALD for semiconductors. We had excellent chemists in, in microchemistry because part of the work was directed to heterogeneous catalysts for oil refining. Now we can see that the same technology works in electronics, micro devices, in, in oil refining and, and wheresoever. And a kind of breakthrough occurred in 1994. Uh, we introduced our machines and some demonstration. You can see the demonstrations, uh, they are semiconductor, silicon wafers with, with thin, uh, very uniform ALD films on top. And that was something that uh, it was a kind of breakthrough so that we were contacted by many semiconductor, 
semiconductor companies, uh, manufacturers, and also equipment suppliers for semiconductor manufacturers. And what happened after, well, microchemistry itself sold uh, some of these uh, components. This, for example, is a, is a big, a big reactor which was sold to, uh, to Denso in Japan. It's a, a subsidiary of Toyota, and they made uh, transparent uh, electrons and flat panels to some of the of Lexus top models. But let's go further here. Uh, a microchemistry itself, so that uh, semiconductor equipment manufacturing doesn't fit very well to an oil company. That's one reason that uh, the uh, activity was, or the company was sold to, to ASM, and they started ASM Microchemistry, which still continues as a, as a, a research company group in, in Finland. Uh, but the, the production of the reactors was moved to the United States in early, early 2000. But as a result, sorry, we, we start here. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, expertise still was here, and uh, Sven Lindfors, colleague of mine who worked with me since 1975, uh, brought the technology to Picosan. He was one of the, of the, uh, of the uh, founders of Picosan and also from microchemistry, uh, Pekka Soininen then brought the technology to, to Benek Oy. So we have two ALE reactor manufacturers in Finland at present time. Today there's a lot of competition already, so that there was, this is a list of something like 30 uh, uh, reactor manufacturers, ASM is a market leader. They got an excellent start by, by buying microchemistry here. But uh, and now the, the total markets of ALE reactors is something like two billion uh, dollars or euros a year. And the curve goes nicely upwards. It looks like a hockey stick curve, uh, <coughs> long time with, with a very slow growth and now we have started and it, uh, the start started when the <coughs> semiconductor community understood the value of, of ALD. We had tried to sell the technology to a semiconductor manufacturer in, in early 80s but it turned out that there was no need. They, they, they didn't show any interest to that because they thought that it is more expensive, more complex than whatsoever, so they can work with the, the existing technologies. But the situation changed when we go to the, to the nano level, nanometer scale. And for this audience, this is very interesting film. <coughs> so we look at the scientific activity. <coughs> Finland still has very... Uh, meaningful uh, status here because uh, early we started uh, cooperation with Tampere University. I, I gave uh, a few years uh, as a docent there, I gave lectures on electron physics as a, as a site activity uh, in, in 70s for a couple of years. And then uh, Helsinki University of Technology, University of Joensu, where we started working with quantum chemistry at early 80s. Then the calculations were made in London with, with superconductors who made, which, were, which made about at least almost the same as your, your laptop computers today. But, but that's how the world has changed indeed. Okay, so with the, the number of, sorry, the number of doctoral theses in Finland, we have uh, last summer statistics was 91, I think it's more now, and the rest of the world. It's, so the comparison is Finland and the rest of the world here. And the number of, of publications, the number of patents, uh, they, they have the same shape here. So there's a very, very long, narrow area here. And still further, there's some uh, quick a look to the, to the scientific events. In the early stage, we didn't publish very much because it was a commercial proprietary information. And, and for scientists, it's a very 
a frustrating situation. We would like to have contacts with scientific communities. And at the same time, we can't tell everything. We can tell something, but not, not tell the whole story. And it doesn't work in scientific community very well. It's something I think it's, it's worth discussing and, 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 and uh, thinking about in a few, for the future. So the explosive increase in the early activity Activity started when, when the research, when, when the semiconductor industry became interested, and it turned out to be important there. And now we have the Finnish Center of Excellence in Atomic Layer Epitaxy for, for many years already. So you can see the, uh, the smile of Professor uh, <coughs> Marko Leskela here, and he still works for the ALD. And then technological and scientific impact of ALD. We have it here. Now we heard about the Moore's law. And uh, <coughs> ALD was invented in, in 1974, and its contribution to Moore's law started in, in early 2000. And now it's, this is the way it, 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 it contributes to the, to the uh, semiconductor industry. And we can once again see the same picture as we saw before. And this point here is the 10 nanometer technology by Intel. i like to, to uh, uh, finalize with a general uh, time span and hierarchy of technical developments. So we, have, we used to have new models of of mobile phones almost monthly and behind that we have a technology which extends to a couple of years new generations of products uh, have a longer development span technologies behind manufacturing when you go deeper we go in the material science the longer is the development now we are already in the tens of years then further going further here the basic research for technology and application opportunities so that we need basic research which goes even further so that we have to understand the purpose of the science is to make nature understandable. It's not, only, it's not enough just to understand uh, mathematics which uh, fits with observations, but it's very important to understand the, the physics behind the mathematics. Understanding of the laws of nature and refinement of those into the theories. Now we go, go back to, to, uh, to hundreds of years. And finally, cultural heritage, understanding of human nature, which is behind everything, all activities, human activities, when we can speak of, of even up to 1,000 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sundola, for this fantastic talk. It was really amazing to hear it. Now, there is room for questions. Who, who will start? There. And please wait for the microphone before asking questions. Congratulations, Tuomo. What a great day for Aalto and what a great day for Finland. Um, Amazing uh, invention. Uh, my question is that um, it's it kind of when we think about the face of technology today, uh, it is kind of, and we think about investors. And if we say to other investors that you know, after 40 years, you will have million or billion euro business, it's not enough, you know, even if the invention is great. Of course, you already had a business before that, but uh, but it still took many decades to really to have the boom, boom in your, uh, your technology. So um, my question is that, um, do you think that it was kind of okay? Did you do everything right? Or could you have somehow even had an earlier sort of exponential growth in, 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 in there? Yeah, it's, uh, 
You know, it's very, very important but very, very difficult question because, as you noticed here, there were several steps in getting ahead. It's very, very difficult to convince an investor that let's start something very, very important, probably very important basic work so that we probably can find the results after 40 years. So I, I think it's very, very difficult to, to raise funding for such things. So what we need is that we, we have to find the, the steps. And, and it's, it's very advantageous if, if we can put steps which can be realized in reasonable time, but on the same time to give, get, get confidence to the development for the next steps. So that, that here, uh, let's say, was it, was it, were there lucky co coincidences or, or uh, something else, but, but we were offered opportunities to, to follow such steps that, that new goals could be built on the, on the results obtained by that time. I don't know whether I, I answered all the questions, but, but, but that's that what we can find. Okay. Other questions? Sit there, please. Yeah. Well, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Actually, a lecture of history, in a sense. From some point of view, very short history, and from personal points of view, rather long history. But let's, let's take some, some science into this, and not just general, general talks. What about the time, the temperature scales you can use? Um, you, you mentioned already that it's critical to find certain limits where this uh, technology can work. And, but then, on the other hand, uh, substrate temperatures is often often a problem in, in electronics. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when you mentioned the shielding of OLEDs, organic... Sorry, you mentioned what? OLEDs, yeah. organic LEDs, or, or organic displays. Uh, what are the, the temperature possibilities of this method from, from that point of view? Mm -hmm. How flexible is it? Well, you know, there are, there, are some, there are several ways of enhancing or getting down the temperature and, and, and one, one of, the, of the processes is that we, get, we need some extra energy for, for completing the chemical reaction. One is using plasma, uh, then of course the more reactant, uh, reactive, uh, reactant we are able to find then we can get down, to the, down in the temperature so that it's, it's very, very demanding chemistry and also understanding the, the possibilities. Some people are, have been succeeded uh, using ultraviolet uh, in a light or microwave in order to, uh, to uh, uh, finalize the reactions. But whenever we have such kinds of, of extra means, it means that we probably lose something of the self-control because it's very difficult to get plasma penetrated through a narrow, a narrow channel, for example. The same is true for, uh, for ultraviolet light or something else too. That, so that the, the, it's the better we, we can handle that with the chemistry, then we can utilize all the basic advantages of the ALD. Questions? Well, uh, I have one, at least one. <laughs> so, um, what's your opinion? Have all the, let's say, feasible choices for ALD materials already been tried? No. Or, or what, what would be the interesting new uh, options to try which materials? I, I, can't sim I simply can't answer that question because if we now look, make a new look to the, to the periodic table of chemical elements and start marking which materials can be handled with the ALD, I think we have, we have already filled most of the chart uh, so that uh, even <coughs> we have, all the time we have spoken about uh, compounds made with the ALD because then we have two, two uh, different uh, reactants for the different uh, components but in fact we can certainly make also elemental materials using some chemical tricks here using a compound of the metal first and then release the extra part of the of the molecule and then start uh, putting the next one so in fact the uh, the build up of, of nice 
conformal metallic layer has become a very important part of semiconductor manufacturing. In a modern semiconductor uh, process, there may be tens of ALD uh, process phases, uh, steps, process steps in the production chain. So that is not only a question of making one layer or two or three layers, but, but uh, a high, nu high number of process steps with different, with different purpose in, in making the fine lithography, self-aligning lithography, and then of course the, the very original idea of, of high K dielectric layer, which handles the, the low power consumption and fast switching. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the very, very inspiring uh, uh, talk and um, um, also a lesson about sort of the uh, uh, determination that one needs to, to push these kinds of uh, areas through. Now we have seen this kind of a revolution or breakthrough in semiconductor industry and uh, really an exponential use. Uh, what are the, the next areas where you would predict that the, the kind of sem similar um, uh, a uh, phenomenon will, will, uh, will happen that you know, the, the applications of ALD start growing very fast. Well, that's very, very, it's very, very difficult to, to think about future possibilities. Whenever you ask such things from an expert, normally he fails in seeing the possibilities because he's restricted to his own, to his own, uh, own knowledge, which... Uh, <coughs> which is available today, so that uh, we are open to, to see new openings. I think medical instrumentation, bio, biochemistry, and as I mentioned somewhere here, so that ALD has become a tool in surface chemistry, so that understanding in more generally chemistry at molecular level, or chemistry that we can think about, uh, think about uh, uh, <coughs> the boundary between inorganic chemistry and, and organic chemistry and even go further to, to biochemistry and that kind of thing so that there are enormous possibilities still. There are still enormous possibilities in electronics, so let's not forget that. <laughs> there was one question over there. First, thank you for really thought-inspiring and fantastic lecture and uh, you mentioned that if you had been a chemist, you would possibly have realized those, those uh, issues there very earlier. Uh, now, uh, there's all the time more and more things to learn, and more and more complicated phenomena to understand, but our cognitive uh, capacity is about the same as it has, has been. So basically the question is that how should we divide when we think of educating and learning, I also in master's, the master's level, also in, in research, how should we divide this capacity to either knowing a lot of things from, from many things and deep in some, or be deep in, say, two areas? Uh, what would be your message be uh, to uh, future researchers that how should they think of this? this transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, so that it would be, as, and us as educators, how should we think our curricula to, so that we could provide both this deep knowledge in one area and enough possibilities to combine areas? Yeah, that's a very, very important question, of course. Yeah. And uh, clearly I don't have any, <laughs> any direct answer to that, but, but generally I think this already is an example that it's, it's very helpful to, uh, to, to combine different, uh, <coughs> uh, di uh, different disciplines so that physics, chemistry and, and, uh, and, and then technology. Uh, if you don't need to do everything yourself, but you need capability of discussing with people uh, from, from other areas, and I think that's one, uh, one chance and challenge you have in, in Alta University, because that's already an, uh, 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 a step to that direction, the combining, combining arts, business and, and technology, so that being able to discuss people with, with different background is a skill in itself, so that I think it's worthwhile developing this kind of skills. You don't need to, do, to make everything yourself. Maybe if I've been, you, you asked, in the beginning you mentioned, if I had 
understood more chemistry. Maybe, maybe that had been an advantage. Maybe I never had started that thing at all, because, because after I had presented the, the process, I got excellent feedback from the, from the display conference, but I didn't tell the, the other part next. After that conference, I was invited to give a talk on, on ALE in a crystal growth conference. And they were more or less confused because at that time I called the, uh, the, the process atomic layer epitaxy, because epitaxy means on arrangement instead of just transfer material. And for silicon people, epitaxy means narrowly growth of single crystal. They were skeptic to, to the whole thing, and after a few months after the conference, I received a letter uh, uh, from, uh, from a professor, well-known professor in the field, who uh, explained that the ALE is, is not possible, and he had proven that with uh, several laboratory uh, experiments, and I, I got also the, the laboratory re uh, reports which show that ALE is not possible. It's very philosophically very interesting question. How do you prove with experiment that something is not possible? <laughs> Think about that. That's true. Okay, this is probably the right words to, <laughs> for ending the discussion. So thank you, Dr. Suntola. Thank you for you. And now I invite everybody to have some refreshments outside and you can come to a talk to Tuomo Sundala personally. There are also some Aalto magazines that contain a story about him. You can take those if you are interested. Thank you.